Today's podcast is brought to you by Hypervape. Hypervape.com. Sleek, discreet, and reliable. That's H Y P R V A P E. Hypervape.com. Welcome to the Drift and Ramble podcast. I'm Steve Blizzen. Each episode, we'll explore true stories and American legends. From the pages of history and a few stories handed down over the years, we'll look at the people, places, and events that helped shape a nation. Stories of survival, notable frontier men and women, explorers who struck it rich, and the outlaws that stole it from them. There'll be studies of saloon girls, swindlers, banditry, and bad men, profiles of lawmen and American Indians, and the good and evil that existed between them. We'll amble through the past, we'll delve into the folklore of the times, and maybe even uncover a ghost story or two. So, saddle up, or settle in, for the Drift and Ramble podcast. This is episode 13. In the previous episode, we learned about the storied career of lawman Bat Masterson, and how he spent the first 30 years of his life earning a reputation as a man proficient with a six-gun. But in the last 30 years of his life, he transitioned from gunfighter to sports writer, and eventually he wrote about some of his more notable friends. Folks like Luke Short, Ben Thompson, Wyatt Earp, and Doc Holliday. On today's show, Bat Masterson talks about the three most important qualities of a gunfighter and of his friend Ben Thompson, a man known for his handiwork with a rifle and a revolver. In 1907, Bat Masterson was asked by Human Life magazine to write a series of articles about the many gunfighters and legendary figures of the Old West that Bat Masterson knew personally. What follows is one of these articles, Bat Masterson in his own words. Ben Thompson by Bat Masterson I've been asked by human life to write something about the noted killers of men I am supposed to have personally known in the early days on the western frontier, and of who their number I regarded as the most courageous and the most expert with a pistol. In making this request, I may reasonably assume the editor did not consider that he was imposing on me very much of a task and had it embodied nothing more than the question of proficiency with the pistol, such would have been the case. But in asking me to offer an opinion on the question of physical courage, as sometimes exemplified by them under nerve-trying conditions, he has placed a responsibility on my shoulders that I hardly care to assume. I have known so many courageous men in that vast territory lying west and southwest of the Missouri River. Men who, when called upon, face death with utter indifference as to the consequences. That it would be manifestly unjust for me to ever attempt to draw a comparison. Courage to step out and fight to the death with a pistol is but one of three qualities a man must possess to last very long in this hazardous business. A man may possess the greatest amount of courage possible and still be a pathetic failure as a gunfighter, as men are often called in the West who have gained reputations as man-killers. Courage is of little use to a man who essays to arbitrate a difference with the pistol if he is inexperienced in the use of the weapon he is going to use. Then again, he may possess both courage and experience and still fail if he lacks deliberation. Any man who does not possess courage, proficiency in the use of firearms, and deliberation had better make up his mind at the beginning to settle his personal differences 
in some other manner than by appeal to the pistol. I have known men in the West whose courage could not be questioned, and whose expertness with the pistol was simply marvelous, who fell easy victims before men who added deliberation to the other two qualities. I will cite a few such instances that came under my own personal observation. The Harrison Levy Feud Thirty-five years ago, Charlie Harrison was one of the best-known sporting men west of the Missouri River. His home was in St. Louis, but he traveled extensively throughout the West and was well-known through the Rocky Mountain region. He was of an impetuous temperament, quick of action, of unquestioned courage, and the most expert man I ever saw with a pistol. He could shoot faster and straighter when shooting at a target than any man I ever knew. Then, add to that the fact that no man possessed more courage than he did, the natural conclusion would be that he would be the most formidable foe to encounter in a pistol duel. In 1876, he started for the Black Hills, which was then having a great mining boom on account of the discovery of gold at Deadwood. When Charlie reached Cheyenne, he became involved in a personal difficulty with another gambler by the name of Jim Levy, and both men started for their respective lodgings to get their pistols and have it out the first time they met. It looked like 100 to 1 that Harrison would win the fight because of his well-known courage and proficiency in the use of a pistol. Little being known at the time about Jim Levy, Harrison was made a hot favorite in the betting in the various gambling resorts of Cheyenne. The men were not long in getting together after securing their revolvers, which were of Colt's pattern and of 45 caliber in size. They met on opposite sides of the principal street of the city and opened fire on each other without a moment's delay. Harrison, as was expected, fairly set his pistol on fire. He was shooting so fast and managed to fire five shots at Levy before the latter could draw a bead on him. Levy finally let go a shot. It was all that was necessary. Harrison tumbled into the street in a dying condition and soon afterwards laid to rest alongside of the others who had gone before him in a similar way. That Harrison was as game a man as Levy could not be doubted. That he could shoot much faster, he had given ample proof. But under extraordinary conditions, he had shown that he lacked deliberation and lost his life in consequence. The trouble with Charlie Harrison was just this. He was too anxious. He wanted to shoot too fast. Levy took his time. He looked through the sights on his pistol, which is a very essential thing to do when shooting at an adversary who is returning your fire. Johnny Sherman, another well-known Western sport and near relative of the famous Sherman family of Ohio, was another remarkably fine pistol shot. When he happened to be where he could go out and practice with his pistol, he would hunt up a shooting gallery and spend an hour or so practicing with the gallery pistols. Wanted to shoot too fast. In this way, he had become an adept in the use of the revolver. He was, as everyone who knew him can testify to, as courageous as a lion. And yet, when he started in to kill a dentist in a room in a St. Louis hotel, who had, as he claimed, insulted his wife, he emptied his pistol at the dentist without as much as puncturing his clothes. And mind you, the dentist was not returning his fire. Sherman, like Harrison, was in too big a hurry to finish the job and forgot that there were a set of sights on his pistol. Levi Richardson is another case in point that will serve to show that coolness and deliberation are very essential qualities in a shooting scrape, and unless a man possesses them, he is very apt to fall victim to the man who does. Levi Richardson had been a buffalo hunter with me on the plains of western Kansas for several years. 
We were very close friends and shared our blankets with each other on a great many cold winter nights when blankets were a very useful commodity. He was thoroughly familiar with the use of firearms and an excellent shot with either pistol or rifle. He was a high-strung fellow who was not afraid of any man. He got a notion into his head one night in Dodge City, Kansas, that a young gambler by the name of Frank Loving, generally known as Cockeyed Frank, had done him some wrong, and forthwith made up his mind to kill him on sight. He publicly declared what he intended to do to Loving as soon as he met him, and some busybody who had been listening to the threats hastened away to put Loving on his guard. Frank Loving was a mere boy at the time, but he was not afraid and immediately proceeded to arm himself and be prepared to deal out the best that he had when his man came. He did not have to wait very long, for Richardson was a man to act promptly once he had made his mind up to do a certain thing, and as he had decided on killing Loving, with as little delay as possible, the battle was on almost before a person had time to think. Richardson found Loving sitting unconcernedly at a card table in the Long Branch Saloon and instantly opened fire on him with his Colt's 45 caliber pistol. He fired five times at his man in rapid success, but missed with every shot and was finally shot dead by Loving, who took his time about his work. It was the cleanest possible shot. Richardson, like Harrison and Sherman, did not take sufficient time to see what he was doing, and his life paid the penalty. No one, however, who knew both men could truthfully say that Loving possessed a greater degree of courage than Richardson, or that under ordinary conditions he was a better marksman with a gun. Courage, generally speaking, is daring. Nerve is steadiness. I was the sheriff of the county at the time and refused to lock Loving up in jail, holding that he had, in killing Richardson, only acted in self-defense and permitted him to be at large on his own recognizance until his preliminary examination was held, which exonerated him as I knew it would. I have never stood for murder and never will, but I firmly believe that a man who kills another in defense of his own life should always be held blameless and will always lend a helping hand to such a man. Frank Loving was himself murdered three years later by another gambler by the name of John Allen in Trinidad, Colorado. Allen, soon after his acquittal for the murder of Loving, became a street preacher, and of course all has been forgiven. The Career of Ben Thompson But all this is preliminary to the real purpose of this story, which is to tell something about Ben Thompson, the famous gunfighter of Austin, Texas. Ben Thompson was born in England, and came to this country with his family when a boy. The family settled in Austin, Texas, and Ben learned the printer's trade and set type in the local newspaper offices of the city. When the Civil War broke out, he enlisted as a private in one of the Texas regiments and went to the front to fight battles of the lost cause. He was only a boy when he enlisted, but was not long in showing the kind of metal that was in him. While serving in General Kirby Smith's command during the campaign along the Red River, young Thompson performed many deeds of great daring, such as crossing into the enemy's lines and carrying important dispatches for the officers of his command. For the dash and courage he displayed at the Battle of Sabine Crossroads just above the mouth of Red River in Louisiana, he was promoted to the rank of captain by his commanding officer. At the conclusion of the hostilities between the North and the South, Ben returned to his home in Austin, but did not remain long. The spirit of war was now upon him, and he longed for more conflict.
Austin was too peacefully disposed for him, so he immediately set out for Old Mexico, where Maximilian was just then having a lively time maintaining himself in the position of Emperor of Mexico. After getting on Mexican soil, Ben lost no time in reaching the headquarters of Maximilian's army, where he tendered his services in behalf of the invader's cause. He was instantly accepted and commissioned a captain and was soon wearing the uniform of the emperor's army. Ben, however, was not given much opportunity to achieve distinction in the invading army, for Maximilian soon after suffered a collapse and Thompson was lucky to get away from the Mexicans and reach his home in Austin with his life. Ben Thompson was a remarkable man in many ways, and it is very doubtful if, in his time, there was another man living who equaled him with the pistol in a life-and-death struggle. Thompson was, in the first place, possessed with a much higher order of intelligence than the average gunfighter or man-killer of his time. He was much more resourceful and a better general under trying conditions than any of that great army of desperate men who flourished on our frontier 30 years ago. He was absolutely without fear, and his nerves were those of the finest steel. He shot at an adversary with the same precision and deliberation that he shot at a target. He was a past master in the use of the pistol, and his aim was as true as his nerves were strong and steady. He had, during his career, more deadly encounters with the pistol than any man living, and won out in every single instance. The very name of Ben Thompson was enough to cause the general run of man-killers, even those who had never seen him, to seek safety in instant flight. Thompson killed many men during his career, but always in an open and manly way. He scorned the man who was known to have committed murder and looked with contempt on the man who sought unfair advantages in a fight. The men who he shot and killed were, without exception, men who had tried to kill him, and an unarmed man, or a man who was known to be a non-combatant, was far safer in his company than he would be right here on Broadway at this time. He was what could be properly termed a thoroughly game man, and like all men of that sort, never committed murder. He stood about five feet, nine inches in height, and weighed in later years in the neighborhood of 180 pounds. Wore silk hat and Prince Albert. His face was pleasant to look upon, and his head was round and well-shaped. He was what could be called a handsome man. He was always neat in his dress, but never loud, and wore little, if any, jewelry at any time. He was often seen on the streets of Austin, especially on a Sunday, wearing a silk hat and dressed in a Prince Albert suit of the finest material. While he was not given to taking any unnecessary chances with his life, he would unhesitatingly do so if he felt that occasion demanded it. For example, he had a falling out one day with the proprietor of a vaudeville house in Austin, and that night, just at the busiest hour, went over to the place and fired a shot from his pistol into one of the big chandeliers that was hanging from the ceiling which broke some of the glass shades and scattered pieces of broken glass in all directions over the audience. This, as might be expected, caused an immediate stampede of the patrons who rushed pell-mell for the street. Thompson, when things quieted down somewhat, left the place without offering to do any further mischief. That seemed to satisfy Ben, and in all probability the trouble would have ended then and there, had the proprietor let the matter rest where it was. But he refused to listen to the advice of his friends and openly declared that he intended to get even with Thompson. As a matter of course, everything he said about Ben was instantly carried to him, 
And as is generally the way in such cases, some things he did not say were added to the story by the tail bearers. The threat of the vaudeville man. At any rate, it got noised about town that the vaudeville man was thoroughly organized for Ben and intended to kill him the very first time he stepped inside his house. Of course, Ben was told about what was being said about him by the hurdy-gurdy manager, but only laughed and said that he guessed if he didn't die until he got killed by the showman, he would live a long time. But reports of the threats that were being made against his life by the vaudeville proprietor kept reaching him with such regularity that he finally began to think that perhaps there might be something to them. At any rate, he made up his mind to see for himself how much there really was in those threats that he had been hearing about for so long. So one night, while the show was in full blast, he told a very warm personal friend of his by the name of Zeno Hemphill that he had made up his mind to go over to the show and look over the arrangements he understood had been made for his removal from this veil of tears. Zeno, said Ben, just fall a few feet in behind me and holler if you see anything that doesn't look exactly right to you when I get inside that honky-tonk. Remember, Zeno, I only want you along for a witness in case anything happens, remarked Ben as he started to cross the street to the variety theater that was soon to witness a terrible tragedy within its walls. Ben entered a door that led to the barroom from the street. This barroom was part of the theater, although the stage upon which the performances appeared was in another part of the building. In order to reach that part of the building in which a performance was being given, it was necessary for Ben to pass along the entire length of the bar, then through a pair of swinging doors located about 10 feet further on, through which it was necessary to pass before a view of the stage could be obtained. When Ben first entered the barroom, he took a hasty survey of the surroundings, but saw nothing to cause alarm. In fact, he did not expect the attack to come from that part of the house, if indeed an attack was made at all, but was looking for it to occur after he had reached the theater proper, which would not be until after he had passed the swinging doors. Ben did not stop in the barroom, but kept on walking leisurely towards the swinging doors, and just as he was about to push them apart, he heard Zeno, who had just stepped into the room, cry out, Look out, Ben! But before Ben could scarcely move, the bartender, whose name was Mark Wilson, had raised a double-barreled shotgun that he had lying along the mixing board back of the bar and emptied both barrels, which were heavily loaded with buckshot, at Ben, who could not have been more than ten feet away. Incredible as it may seem, Thompson escaped without a scratch. Mark Wilson, the bartender, was known to be a courageous young fellow who had on several occasions shown considerable fighting grit, and it was for that reason he had been selected to kill Thompson the first time he entered the place. Wilson, however, realizing that he was taking upon himself something of a job in agreeing to dispose of Ben Thompson, concluded that it would be best to get a little help, so he went to his friend, Sam Matthews, and told him what he had made up his mind to do, and asked him if he would help him out in the matter. With great pleasure, replied Matthews, and straight away went for his trusty Winchester rifle, and immediately repaired to the Variety Theater to help out his friend Wilson in putting Ben Thompson out of the way. When Ben entered the barroom that evening, he saw Matthews standing around the corner of the bar, but did not notice that he had a Winchester rifle leaning by his side. In fact, did not regard Matthews, whom he knew quite well, as an enemy, and perhaps for that reason did not look him over very carefully. But to get to the point, the smoke from the shotgun had scarcely blown aside before Ben had whipped out his pistol like a flash of lightning, had shot Wilson dead in his tracks. 
Ben then noticed that Matthews had a Winchester rifle in his hand and instantly concluded that he too was there for the purpose of aiding Wilson in killing him. Matthews seemed to anticipate what was passing through Thompson's mind, for he ducked down behind the bar instead of attempting to use the rifle. Thompson, instead of going around the end of the bar where he could see Matthews, took a rough guess at his location and fired through the end of the bar. The bullet struck Matthews squarely in the mouth and toppled him over on the floor. When the case was called for trial, Ben then turned around and walked out of the place with his friend Zeno Hemphill, who later on, when the case was called for trial, was the most important witness for the defense. Ben was kept locked up in jail pending the preliminary examination and was then admitted to bail and subsequently acquitted. This was only one of a dozen such occurrences that could be cited in the career of this most remarkable man. Wilson and Matthews were unquestionable men of courage, else they could not have been induced to enter into a plot of killing such a desperate man as they knew Thompson to be. But when it came to the scratch, they both lost their nerve, and Ben was privileged to add two more names to the list of ambitious gunfighters who had sought to take his life. Thompson served as chief of police of the city of Austin, and all the old-time citizens of that place remember him still as the best chief of police the city ever had. While Thompson was known throughout all that vast territory lying west and southwest of the Missouri River as the nerviest of men, and as unerring a shot with a pistol as ever lived, there were several men, contemporaneous with himself, who had the occasion arisen, would have given him battle to the death all with nerves of steel. Such men as Wild Bill Hickok, Wyatt Earp, Billy Tillman, Charlie Bassett, Luke Short, Clay Allison, Joe Lowe, and Jim Curry were all men with nerves of steel who had often been put to the test, any one of whom would not have hesitated a moment to put up his life as the stake to be played for. Those men, all of them, lived and played their part and played it exceedingly well on the lurid edge of our western frontier at the time Ben Thompson was playing his. And it is safe to assume that not one of them would have declined the gauge of battle with him had he flung it down to any one of their number. In making this admission, however, I am constrained to say that little doubt exists in my mind that Thompson would have been returned the winner of the contest. Ben Thompson was murdered along with his personal friend, King Fisher, in a vaudeville theater in San Antonio, Texas, in March 1884. Both he and King Fisher were killed from ambush by a number of persons who were concealed in the wings of the stage, and neither ever knew what happened. Ben was hit eight times by bullets fired from a Winchester rifle, and King Fisher was hit five times. All of the shots were fired simultaneously, and both sank to the floor as dead as it is possible to ever be. It was a cold-blooded, cruel, and premeditated murder, for which no one was ever punished by law. You're listening to the Drift and Ramble podcast. We'll be back after this message. Come on, Billy. Let's ride out after them bandits to rob the train. Hang on a second, Clem. My vaporizer won't charge. Now how am I going to have a smoke? Well, Billy, it looks like you should have chose Hypervape. When it comes to e-cigarettes, why settle for something you picked up in the back of a saloon? But Clem, I spent a lot of money on this thing. How much you spend isn't how you measure quality. You measure quality through reliability, longevity, and value. Like this old horse your mom sold me. Gee, I guess you have been riding her a long time. You mean this horse or your mom? Why don't you mosey on over to hypervape.com and place an order, Billy? Old Paint and I will catch up to those bandits. Remember, hypervape.com. Sleek, discreet, and always reliable. That's hypervape.com. 
where outlaws and good guys find quality. Hi, this is Cheryl. If you enjoy our podcast, please be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And take the time to leave us a review on iTunes. Be sure to support our sponsors, and perhaps consider becoming one yourself. You can visit our website at driftandramble.com for details on how to get in touch with us. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Thanks for listening to the Drift and Ramble podcast. The Drift and Ramble podcast is proud to be part of the Pottern family. And you can be part of the family, too. Whether you're a podcaster looking to build your audience and promote your show, or you're a listener looking to find new and interesting podcasts, using the Pottern Family hashtag is all you have to do. It's absolutely free to use. Pottern Family is simply a group of dedicated podcasters looking to help people find, listen, subscribe, and review great podcasts. We love our Pottern family, and we know you will too. And that reminds me to remind you to show some love to the shows you love. If you have a favorite podcast, be sure to leave them a review on iTunes or on Stitcher. Nothing makes a podcaster happier than knowing they're appreciated for all the work they do. What are the different ways to get in touch with us, Cheryl? Well, on Twitter, we're at Drift and Ramble. They can also email us. The email address is driftandramble at gmail.com. What is another fine way they can follow us? Um, Follow us on Facebook. Just look up Drift and Ramble. Isn't our Facebook ID something like Facebook slash Drift and Ramble? I don't know. If they're on Facebook, just type in Drift and Ramble and they'll they'll get there. Yeah, do that. (laughs) There's, There's the Drift and Ramble website. Oh, yeah. That's just driftandramble.com. <laughs> we lose our clean rating. Yeah, we lose our clean rating. You know how we lose our clean rating by not doing laundry for two weeks? I know a dirty joke. Say it. A white horse fell in the mud. That's not funny. <laughs> Made you laugh. We're really bad at this. <laughs> I want to go home now. You are home? Isn't this our holiday special? It's next the beginning. Week. It's this is the beginning of our holiday special. We, it's not next week. It's bi-weekly, so it's the the following. It's oh. every second Sunday. Okay. We should have an FAQ. Frequently asked questions of the Drift and Ramble podcast. <laughs> when, when do new episodes air? Every second Sunday. That's what I said. Every second Sunday, and here's a letter from Johnny who asks. <laughs> <laughs> what does Johnny ask? Why do you keep producing this drivel? All right, this we just painted ourselves into a corner. Weren't you going to do a review for iTunes? I think it's time to do this episode's iTunes review. This time we have a review from Movie Geek Cast. Must for Western history buffs. I've recommended two total podcasts ever to my family. One was Serial and the other was Drift and Ramble. Huge fan of Steve and this show, and it's always at the top of my playlist. If you're a history buff, you can't go wrong. Thanks, Movie Geek Cast. I have a fan. I am also a huge fan of Steve, just for what it's worth. Hey, that's two fans. If you'd like us to mention your review on the show, be sure to leave a review for us. You can leave reviews on iTunes or Stitcher, and we'd love to hear from you. Leave us a review today. Next time on the Drift and Ramble podcast, it's the holiday season, and there's no better time of year to look back at one of the West's wildest characters. Of all the names of all the legends of the Old West, none is more well-known than the infamous dentist from Tombstone, Arizona. A man weakened by disease and fueled by alcohol, who was quick to anger and even faster on the trigger. 
He was fond of the card game Pharaoh and fearless in the face of death. Doc Holliday is the topic of our holiday special. That's Doc Holliday on the next Drift and Ramble podcast. Until we meet again, I'm Steve Blizzen. See you at the next installment of the Drift and Ramble podcast. The Drift and Ramble podcast is a Clear Voice Media production, hosted and produced by Steve Blizzen, with segment research and voice acting by Cheryl Blizzen. Additional contributions and content have been made possible by support from individuals dedicated to the art and science of storytelling and exploring the still fertile promise of the American West.